Good evening, Elizabeth Diamond with the Candy Jar, the Candy Show, and the Elizabeth Diamond Show tonight, Thursday, April 21st, 2016. A sad note for in Minnesota, I'm in Minnesota here, uh, Prince died. He's a music legend like Michael Jackson, Elvis Presley. So we love you, Prince, and it's actually raining here, so apropos, you know, Purple Rain, he wrote that. And I hear some paper shuffling, if you could just star six, mute out, please. Uh, yeah. So unless that's Misty, Misty's coming in, and I'm gonna continue to read Sunshine Before the Dawn. And but Misty's gonna have a card for us tonight, you guys. So fasten your seatbelts. Come on in, Misty. Oh well, thank you, Elizabeth. I actually did have a number that came to my mind when I was shuffling, but I didn't pull the card yet. Go ahead. Um, okay, it'll take me a, a minute. <laughs> so. Um, uh, let's just ask for the highest good of all concern. Uh, that's uh, our angel yeah. us a direct message. Uh, we just call in all our guides and all our guides and all our galactic beings from our time space and all our higher selves. Come on in, the, the flame of divine love, because we are all one and we welcome you and we thank you. And when one has harmed all our harms, when one has helped all help. So therefore, in the name of who we are, and we are one. With all that there is, we ask that only the highest good of all concern happen tonight and every night and every moment in all of our lives, wrapped in supreme happiness with maximum efficiency, minimum effort. That's the perfect prayer right there, you guys. So be it. Namaste. <laughs> what number did you have came into your head? Ooh, it was 63. Beautiful. And the card that came up is earth element pentacles and it's the number four and it's legacy so give me one moment to get there and i am there okay <clears throat> the traditional card is four of pentacles the key words for this card are empowerment ancestry and gifts the woman and, a ma- and man shapeshifters are part human and part elk. The elk is an animal of constructive power. The elk woman and man lead a small herd through a canyon, representing the birth canal. Steep cliffs line both sides of the opening, and the shapes of the earthen and stone cliffs resemble a woman's open legs. The and birth canal, a woman's open legs. Now, come on here. We're talking about the sex stuff. We've been, let me interrupt here, guys. The Diamond oh, Network, Lord. we just okay. started a new series, uh, uh, Sacred Sex, and it's all about you. It, it, it starts with you, not with the partner, and how to, you know, mirror in the marriage chamber. And it's been very popular. So be sure to listen to Monday's call and most every week's call and they're labeled on the YouTube channel, right side of the blog, diamonds with an S forever, three one dot blog dot com. Okay, start over Missy and this is awesome. <laughs> okay. An intricate spider's web fills the background, trying all of the four elements earth, air, fire, and water together. The term spider is from the old English spinning, which means to spin. The web is threaded through a silver fir tree laden with cones, seed of potential. The fir tree is considered female, the tree of birth, and sister to the yew of death. Flowering lavender, used as a healing remedy and thought to be conducive to long life, mixes with clover and covers the ground under the shapeshifter's hooves. Clover's triple leaf is a symbol of the threefold and the goddess. The prophecy. 
This card, or excuse me, this is a card of earthly power, vitality, and surplus energy. It is up to you how to implement and apply your energy and efforts in practical and tangible ways. Material success is indicated when you draw legacy, as well as good physical health and well-being. Empowering and taking care of yourself, you become the steward of your energy and existence. By honoring your personal domain and understanding the qualities of your inner and outer self-created castles, structures you have built through thoughts and actions, you learn to hold on to what works and let go of the rest. There is a possibility of an inheritance, legacy, and gifts. You may become consciously aware of ancestral memory experiences. Well, that hits the nail right on the head for me. I don't know about anybody else, but. Absolutely. What's the picture look like? Well, there are four elk and um, a male and a female. I mean, just kind of, let's see. And they're, they're all walking along a path, and above is like a web. Um are kind of intermingled with them. They're walking along a path with a bunch of, it may have said in the description, I can't remember, but what kind of flowers these are, but there are, there are red, uh, rosy colored uh, flowers along the bottom in the path. It's very serene. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. For those just joining us, the Misty just read a card for all of us, so go back and listen to this after we hang up tonight. It's really great. All goes together. Synchronicity is the key. Yay. Absolutely. And if I could give just one message from this card, it would be um, that we need to really take care of ourselves and keep ourselves in the higher energies and higher vibrations and um, away from trouble. <laughs> and that equals what you just said equals marry yourself, the, our series we're doing in sacred sexuality. Yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> wow. You don't have a um, number for that, do you? The um, Actually, now would be a good it, time for you to give the playback number, if you don't mind. Yeah, the, they're, uh, they're up on YouTube. You'll see Sacred Sexuality. But the I think Monday's show was 410 or 409 reference number. Uh, 409, 4, 410. Monday and Tuesday. Uh, So you would dial the record line if you don't want to go to the YouTube. And the recorded 641-715-3813. Pin number 883267-pound. And then ask for a reference number. Uh, uh, And that's 409-4010, something like that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, well, we'll go forth. I'm, uh, like I said last week, I came on early. I read two chapters, so, and that's up on the YouTube channel. So I read chapter ten last night when you guys came on the live call at 7:30 p.m. And then chapter 11 and 12 I read earlier. So you'll see the show. It says Sunshine chapter 11, 12, and 10. If you miss those chapters and all the other chapters are within Elizabeth Candy shows, or I did tube chops of every chapter and that is on a blog, on the blog. You might want to, there's a little search bar, you can put Sunshine Before the Dawn in there and find it. I got to add all the chapters to it, so I'll be blogging it again soon. But this chapter tonight is chapter 13, no, Diamonds Forever 3113, and the, the chapter title is called Moo which is Atlantis, Lumeria, Lumeria, Moo. And I got some roots in Moo I've found out from Chris. But we're going to read that chapter tonight. So let me get settled. I help. I'm not breaking up. Got to get some light. Okay, let's start. And then we'll have a little discussion, you guys, if you want to come in with comments or anything. Oh got to get in a comfortable space. Okay. For the next few days, all the Syrian team members were busy preparing for their journey to Mu. That's uh, Mu on Lemuria on Earth. Another light ship took them there, and when they arrived at 
Crestalore, the largest of Mu's towns, they were immediately impressed. Esiana told the others that Theonos had said about Mu. They all agreed that it was indeed a place of great natural beauty and very special energy. The next day, they immediately set about taking and analyzing DNA and tissue samples from the people. It was six days later before Esiana had time to ask about the whereabouts of Theona's friend, Scorpio. The first few people she spoke to did not know him, but one suggested that she go to the place of higher learning at the center of the town and ask there. Oh, yes, I know Scorpio, said the woman seated at a desk in the reception hall. In fact, he's only just left. He has been teaching here today. He's probably on his way home. As it's late in the day and he's not a young man, I'll tell you how to get to his house. The woman drew a map of several streets out from the central square. Take this street, she said. Walk all the way to the end and turn right. Then walk all the way to the end of this second street and you'll see Scorpio's house. It is surrounded by a high wall of baked clay, painted white. You can't miss it. It didn't seem a great distance on the map, but the streets were long, and it took a while before Esiana reached the second street and turned right. She pushed on. Tomorrow she would be busy again and have no time, and she really wanted to speak with Scorpio and solve the puzzle of the two islands islands if she could. At last she saw a high white wall at the end of the street. The wall was obviously more for show than for protection, as it had no gate, only a curving entrance path that led up a flight of steps and to a front door painted a deep shade of blue. Essiana hoped that she wasn't inconvenienced in Scorpio by arriving at the end of the day, but she really had no other choice. She knocked on the door. She heard a sound of rustling from within. An older woman opened the door. Yes, she said, smiling at Essiana. Can I help you? My name is Esiana. I am a member of the Syrian delegation that has come to Mu to study the genetics of the people here. My friend in Atlanta, Fiona, suggested that I ask Scorpio some questions about Mu that has that as yet remain unanswered. I know it is late in the day, but I would be grateful if I could speak with him. I am sure that will be possible, said the woman. My name is Mazia. I am Scorpio's wife. I will go and ask my husband if he can meet with you. Please come in and wait in his room. Mazia showed Esiana down a hallway and into a small room, quite dark and lined with shelves on which there were many rolled up scrolls of parchment. She hurried off into another part of the house and Esiana sat down to wait. A few minutes later, she heard footsteps in the corridor. A man, barely five feet tall, stood in front of her. He had round blue black eyes and receding, graying hair. Esiana was a little surprised at the man's short stature, but collected herself quickly. Scorpio, she said, holding out her hand, I am very pleased to meet you. My name is Esiana, and I am a member of the Syrian delegation that has come here to study the genetics of the people of Mu. I am honored to meet you, as I have heard of your wisdom from Theonis, who lives on the island of Undal. She handed Scorpio the gift and the letter from Theonis. This is a letter from Theonis. He was one of my guides while I was staying on the island of Atlantis. I sincerely appreciate that you have agreed to meet with me as I have a question about Moo that I need to to understand. From a small bag tied around her waist, she took the tracing of the two images that Mastiana had drawn and held it out to Scorpio. I have here a drawing that was given to me by someone on Lyra. I think that this image is something to do with Mu, but I'm not sure. Theonis said that you might be able to help me. Scorpio opened the letter from Theonis, read it, read it, put put the gift to one side, and then took the drawing from Messiana. He moved closer to the light. For some moments, he studied the piece of parchment intently, a puzzled look on his face. Then his face lit up. I see, he said. He walked over to the shelves on the wall opposite and took down one of the rolled scrolls of parchment. Let me show you this, he said to Esiana, unfurling the scroll and laying it down on the table. See this map, Esiana? It's a map of part of Mu, a little-known land deep in southern seas. It looks very much like your diagram. He compared the two images carefully. 
Do you see this piece of the Northern Island that goes upward? It's here on this map, and the Southern Island is the same too. I think this is the place, Estiana. This is a map of a place of higher learning for the people of Mu. This land holds certain energies that are wide open to all the star vibrations within this 12-dimensional matrix of the lower heavens that you and I call home. Only the most learned and spiritually aware of our people are allowed to go to this place because on these islands, the energy fields are entirely open to the programming of higher consciousness within this galaxy. I don't know where they thought Mu in Atlantis was, but wasn't Mu somewhere or Lemuria Mu in Hawaii somewhere? I'm not sure, but that's kind of the intel in some other places. Who knows? That I've heard through the grapevine, the intel, where Mu was. Okay, which is really important. This land holds certain energies that are wide open to all the star vibrations within this 12-dimensional matrix of the lower heavens that you and I call home. Only the most learned and spiritually aware of our people are allowed to go to this place. Because on these islands, the energy fields are entirely opened open to the programming of higher consciousness within this galaxy. This means that the people who go to this land have an instant connection to the programming forces of higher consciousness of these 12 dimensions and beyond. Wow. There are actually three islands, but the third island is very small and it is really energetically a remnant of the lower island, which is much larger. This land is as yet sparse sparsely populated. Only two temples exist there on these islands, and they have become places of prayer and communion with the highest energies that we call God, the creator of all. He looked at Essiana. How did you come by such a map? Essiana decided that she had to trust this man, and so she replied, it was brought to me from a friend on Lyra. The only words he wrote on this map were, go to move. Now, the Lyra, in Lyra, there's a Lyra and Stargate, and that's where all beings come in through that Stargate to to come to Earth and other parts of the galaxy. So it's a main Stargate. And uh, Boris, last night on Candy's show, a guest, the Starseed, mentioned Stargate, a main one, and in it, I thought the Lyra and Stargate, it went with what he was saying. <clears throat> The others of my group from Sirius and I plan to come to Mu anyway to continue our research. But now I'm feeling that I should go also go to this place in the Southern Seas. Southern Seas. Remember Southern Seas. I don't know where that is. It's in the ocean, the Southern Oceans, I bet. Do you know how I might get there? I feel that my friend from Lyra might be trying to tell me something important. As the rest of this letter was, was very strange. On the page with the drawings, he wrote and underlined several times the words, go to Mu, or which is Lemuria, the Atlantis and Lemuria. Okay, somebody needs just to start six. Mute out, please. Her eyes pleaded with Scorpio. Please help me get to these islands. Hold on. Hold on, guys. Let me just reset the room. Okay, you can still come in. I just set the moon. The other group from Sirius and I plan to come to Moo anyway to continue our research, but now I'm feeling that I should also go to this place in the Southern Seas. Do you know how I might get there? I feel that my friend from Lyra might be trying to tell me something important, as the rest of this letter was very strange. On the page with the drawings, he wrote the underlined and underlined several times the word go to Moo. Her eyes pleaded with Scorpio. Please help me get to these islands. It means so much to me. This map is all I have left of him. That and this key around my neck. He, Masiana, also gave me this key when I was leaving Lyra. He said that by the time I read this letter, he would be gone. He said to take the key to Earth and that it would guide me where I needed to go. He said it was the key to another place. Maybe that place is somewhere on these two islands in the southern seas. Mastiana is or was the leader of the Galactic Council. He would not speak in riddles unless there was a reason. I feel it's important that I go to these islands, Scorpio. Please, can you help me get there? Scorpio sat down at the table and motioned Essiana to sit next to him. 
Scorpio's wife, Mazia, brought them both a hot, sweet drink flavored with anise. For a few moments, they sat in silence. Anise tastes like black licorice. I like it, though. His eyes scanned as the honest face. He saw only truth and desperation. All right, I will help you, said Scorpio. Come back here in three days, and I will have a pass for you to go to this place. I need more information about you that I can present when making an in- and endorsing the application for you to visit Ontera. Ontera, that's O-N-T-A-R-A, repeated Esiana. Is this the name of these islands? Yes, replied Scorpio. So maybe know somebody knows about Ontera or the southern seas. Where, what lands are around the southern seas, the southern ocean? We'll ask that after I'm done reading this chapter. If anybody knows. Okay. Yes, by Scorpio. In in our tongue, it means the place of... Okay, Ontario, repeated Asiana. Is this the name of these islands? Yes, replied Scorpio. In our tongue, it means the place of the new light. You can only go alone, I am sorry, but I cannot procure a pass for the others in your group, and you will only be able to go for five days. We will take you there, give you a hovercraft vehicle for transportation, and then you will be alone. The few people living on Ontario live at the temples, one in the land to the north and one in the southern island. You will be free to travel wherever you wish. Asiana's face relaxed and she almost cried. Thank you so much. I am very grateful to you, Scorpio. I will return here in three days. Does it matter when I go to Ontario? It is difficult for me to get away right now. And I think that this trip is best left until after we complete our research. In another 30 days, we should be almost complete, and then I will be free to go for a few days. I will schedule your trip within that time period, replied Scorpio. His face softened. Don't worry, Esiana. I'm sure this Lyran man is fine. Maybe he just wanted you to be sure to go to Ontario while you are here on Mu. It is a very special place. Esiana floated back to her accommodation as if her feet were walking on clouds. She hardly noticed the distance. Thirty more days, and then maybe she would discover what the key around her neck was all about and why Amasiana so badly wanted her to go to the southern outpost of Mu, the place of the new light. The thirty days went by quickly. Esiana felt much happier that she at last knew what Masiana's map meant and was anxious to leave for the islands in the south. She visited Scorpio several times, and they developed a close rapport. He procured the pass for her to go to Ontario. It did not stipulate a a definite day, only an open time period for travel. Scorpio told her many stories about the land of Mu. He told her he was short in stature because his mother was from a star far away on the other side of the galaxy. An intergalactic trader had stolen her from her people and brought her to Atlantis. There she was, freed by order of Plegia, the Pleiadian king who had at that time already ruled Atlantis for hundreds of years. There she married Scorpio's father, a man called Gaia, Gaius. When Scorpio first came to move from Atlantis, it was a fledging colony, an Atlantean outpost. Now it was a sovereign state within its own rulers all about the daughter and son-in-law of Pelagia. The people of Mu were happy, as the Palladians lived in ethos of peace and love. They welcomed and accepted others from throughout the cosmos for who they were and what they had to contribute to their society. They believed in equality for all, and goodness and goodwill flowed from them as part of their race consciousness. The day before Esiana was due to depart for the southern land of Ontario, she had an unpleasant shock. She was walking down a street in Crystalore when she saw Capricio coming toward her. He looked unsettled when he saw her and quickly looked away, crossing over and passing by on the other side of the street. It was quite obvious to Esiana that he did not wish to run into her, nor did he wish her to see him. What was he doing here in Crystalore, she wondered. She felt very uncomfortable. She had a sick sense that Capricio was not all he claimed to be, and she wondered why he had come from Atlantis to Mu. Capricio is the guy that came and looks a lot like her 
her friend Marciana and gave her a message for Marciana. Anyway, she was on her way to say goodbye to Scorpio, and she decided to ask him whether he had ever heard of Capricio or knew anything about him. She found her friend Scorpio sitting in his little office drinking a large glass of soured milk sweetened with honey. Hmm, interesting. Scorpio, I saw a man in the street today, began Essiana. It's the same man who brought Mastiana's letter from Lyra. His name is Capricio. There is something about his energy that I don't quite like. It's hard for me to it, to imagine that Mastiana would trust him to deliver a letter to me, yet I compared Mastiana's handwriting with another letter he wrote, and I'm sure that they are the same. Mastiana also wrote the letter in the universal language of light of the star nation, which is is a very complicated script to write and understand. I'm pretty sure that Capricio could not have done that. Capricio told me he was an intergalactic trader and that he was beginning a new business venture in Atlantis. Yet today I saw him here in Crystalor. I don't think he realized that I saw him as I didn't wave or acknowledge him in any way. He looked rather shaken to see me and immediately crossed to the other side of the street. Have you heard anything about him or know why he is here? No, I can't say I have, said Scorpio, but I will have him checked out and let you know after you return from Ontario. Don't worry, he said kindly, patting her shoulder. I'm sure everything will be fine. Essiana did not stay long as she had to attend a meeting with the others. They had seven more days of work to complete their analysis and report. It had been very demanding, but it had also been a very rewarding time spent here on Earth. She was grateful that the others had agreed that she could go to the southern land while they completed the work. Southern land. We've got to think southern ocean. <coughs> okay. Although she was in charge, she did not misuse her authority over them. And she was pleased that they appreciated appreciated her desire to go to Ontario. She hadn't explained about the map, only that Scorpio had procured a pass for her. They had all thought it a wonderful opportunity and were pleased for her. They had made her promise to bring back lots of recorded images of the place so that they could see what it looked like. At dawn the next day, she was ready to leave. The light ship that was to take her to Ontario would literally be flying south in, into the new day. Only three others in addition to the crew of the craft were, were to go. Her fellow travelers were two women who were to study at the temples and a young man whom she later learned had something of a personal nature to overcome and who had applied for and been granted leave to meditate and come to terms with himself on the southern island. Southern island. During the flight, Essiana and the other travelers chatted together and got to know one another. The journey, journey seemed to pass quickly. As they neared the northern of the two main islands of Ontario, the light ship descended through thick white clouds, and Essiana began to see mountains, valleys, and dense green vegetation covering the land. Then she saw a large body of water, like a vast lake at the side of the lake. <laughs> cleared land on which stood the temple and other buildings that housed and supported the people who lived there. The light ship began to hover vertically, the powerful upward thrust of its inner engines, keeping it stable as it slowly and steadily cleaned closer to the ground. Essiana could see that several people came from the temple complex to wait beside the landing strip as the light ship descended. There was a slight bump, and soon they were all outside, standing on the grass strip beside the lake. A young man stepped forward to greet them. He introduced himself as Ramondo and said that he would be happy to show them around the temple complex and introduce them to the people who lived there. So you are Essiana from Syria, he said as they walked together toward the temple. I have been told to let you have have the use of one of our transporter craft while you're here. You will enjoy traveling around these islands. There's much to see. You'll find the transporter craft easy to operate and maneuver. These vehicles are surrounded by a cushioning force of energy that prevents damage or collision. Oh, that's nice. Even when skimming over trees, if you get too close, you bounce off. Oh, that's nice. You can also never go too high as the craft will only rise to the highest of three men above 
any solid objects on the ground. You will, you will enjoy it, he said, smiling. These vehicles go fast. In the five days you're here, you can easily travel to the southern island if you wish. Essiana thanked Ramondo and told him about the space mobile she had at home on Sirius. They chatted companionably together as Ramondo took the new arrivals to a communal dining hall. A smiling young woman... <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, a smiling young woman who turned out to be Ramondo's wife brought them food, a type of soup made with roots and vegetables, and a flatbread she had made of seeds grounded to a pulp and baked in two large open ovens. Asiana talked for quite a while to Ramondo. She even told him about her arrival in Atlantis about Capricio. He said he was an intergalactic trader and he was starting a new business venture in Atlantis, she told him. I was rather surprised to see him on the streets of Crestalor. That night she sat alone in prayer at the temple. Above her, an enormous quartz crystal reflected the light of the full moon like a thousand diamonds captured in the prismatic faces of the crystal. Oh, that would be beautiful. Here in the stillness of the sacred southern land, southern land, southern sea, southern ocean. She felt very close to her home in the stars. For a long time, she sat in prayer, asking God, the creator of all, to guide her journey, to take her where she needed to go. Her fingers clasped the golden key around her neck. Was this the key to a real door, she wondered? And if so, where might that door be? As far as she knew, there 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 were only these two temple complexes in the southern land. Surely Marciana would not have the key to either. Okay. Okay. As she rubbed the key between her fingers, she felt its high, loving energy. And that was her hope. Marciana could not be gone from life in the physical form if she was still able to feel his energy so strongly. She remembered the words of Marciana's note to her when she left Lyra. She had repeated them so many times she knew them by heart. This golden key is the key to my heart, but it is also the key to another place. Guard it carefully and take it with you to earth. It will protect you and guide you where you need to go, but most importantly, it will bring you back to me. She had never thought much about the key being able to guide her where she needed to go, but now here in Ontario, She wondered about these words. She had no idea where she should go. How could the key guide her? She looked carefully at the strange inscriptions on the key. She rubbed them and her body grew warm. She walked over to the door of the temple to try the key in the the lock, but the temple door had no lock. She sat down and rubbed the key with her fingers again. She felt a surge of energy flow through her body. It felt like Mastiana's energy. But there was something more. It was almost as if here in this place called Ontera that was so open to the programming and information from the stars, the key was somehow communicating to her telepathically. It felt as though she heard a voice whispering to her when she rubbed the key. Go north, said the voice. We will guide you. Listen to our words and we will take you where you need to go. Asiana heard the voice quite clearly and knew it was certainly not her own. This voice speaking to her in the language of light had a strange inflection, an accent that she did not know from all her travels throughout the galaxy. She dropped the key into her lap and the voice went away. She picked up the key and rubbed it again. Immediately, she heard the words, follow where we lead. We know where you need to go. Follow us. Asiana felt deeply into her inner truth. When she heard the words speak to her, she did not feel fear. She felt only love and a deep sense of peace. She experimented several times, dropping the key onto her lap and then picking it up and rubbing it. She discovered that it was only when she rubbed the key between her fingers that she heard the strange voice speak to her. She decided that because the voice felt high and loving and Mastiana had given her the key, she would allow the voice of the key to guide her on her journey. 
She slept well that night, heartened by the knowledge that she was not alone. She felt that the mysterious voice, whosoever it was, and wherever it was from, was there to help her get to where she needed to go and find what needed to be found. <clears throat> the next day, after a breakfast of fruit and nuts with the others in the dining hall, Asiana went with Romando to the transporter craft that she was to use for her travel throughout the two islands that comp- comprised Ontario. Asiana found the vehicle very comfortable, with just enough space for two people and their luggage. It was also very easy to operate. There was one switch to ascend, descend, go left, and go right, and one to start and stop. Hey, I could try that too. All you had to do was click the switch to start, press lift, and the craft automatically lifted into the air about 20 feet over any obstacles on the ground. It operated at two speeds, fast to take you where you wanted to go quickly, and slow, a sedate walking pace that allowed you to see and absorb nature around you. You can even fly over the mountains in this craft, said Romando. It will automatically sense the peaks and hollows and keep you always 20 feet above them. It's really easy to drive. Oh. Okay. One second, guys. Oh. I'm okay. I lost my space. I'm here. Okay. Let's see. We got one, two, a few more. Okay. Okay. Easy to drive. All right. <clears throat> Familiar with operating her space mobile on Sirius, Asiana quickly understood how to operate the vehicle, and with a quick wave in to Romando and a hug to the others, she had met on the light ship. She was away. She found it easy to fly over the forest and flat grassy plains and headed toward the north. As she neared the bush-covered northern hills, she set the transporter craft down in a flat, gently sloping basin. She wanted to hear the voice within the key and understand what it had to say. She got out of the transporter craft and with her feet on the earth, reached up with her arms toward the sun, high overhead. She prayed, Mother, Father, God, creator of all, help me to understand why I have come to this place on Terra, what it is that I need to find. Show me where it is that I need to go and what it is that I need to do. Taking the key from around her neck, she gently rubbed it, feeling into its energy. She immediately felt the essence of Mastiana flood through her bo- her body, and then another vibration. The high loving energy spoke to her. Now is the time to begin your quest. This key will unlock a door. It is for you to find this door and walk beyond. Go north and then to the east of this land. There you will find what you seek. As the key around your neck begins to grow warm, then you will know you are near that, this place. The key will guide you. Asiana placed the key back around her neck and felt it again. It was cold to the touch. Here's this. (coughs) Ah, I need some water, I think. She got back into the transporter craft and flew north toward the sun as it rose higher into the sky. After some time, she came to the sea. There was land stretching to the right and to the left and a large inlet in between. She chose to go to the right toward the east, and as she veered in that direction, she felt the key lying against the bare skin of her chest begin to grow warm and then start to pulsate gently. She was flying now over dense forests, trees with large leafy fronds like nothing she had ever seen before, and other much taller trees. Huge giants of the forest reaching up to the sky overhead. The transporter craft flew 20 feet over the top of the trees, and Asiana looked down between their majestic branches to the forest floor below. What she saw amazed her, amazed her. The forest floor was black with ancient flora. It smelled rich and dark and wonderful, 
It was like looking down in, into the womb of all creation. Uh, the womb of the great earth mother herself. Essiana marveled that in this far outpost of Mu, which literally meant motherland, she should find the mother of the motherland here in this place of the new light on Terra. The womb of the earth, mother earth. And that was the card tonight too from Misty. In our sex talk series, Sacred Sex. The key around her neck began to throb and pulsate with energy. She showed her speed and tested by going in different directions. She slowed her speed and tested by going in different directions. When she went straight ahead, the key was warm and pulsating, but it grew warmer when she flew further east. She changed direction slightly and, and flew according to where she was led by the key. In the distance, she could see the blue water of what looked like the sea of the earth. She could just begin to make out a sandy shore, a long beach of golden white sand <clears throat> stretching before her onwards to the horizon as far as the eye could see. The lush green of the forest covered the land all the way down to the shore. In the distance, gentle waves washed the sands with white, frothy foam. Essiana was feeling a little tired and more than a little hungry. She had brought enough food with her for seven days. She anticipated returning to the temple within five days, as this was when she was expected back in crystal lore. But she had erred on the side of caution in case she got lost and could not find her way back. She decided to land the craft on the beach closest to her and steered the transporter in that direction. She felt the key grow cold against her chest, so she knew that this was not the place. She decided to go there anyway to eat and take a walk along the sand. Ah, well, just let me readjust my book. I'm bending my neck. Ah, one second, guys. Okay. Flying down and landing on the beach, she pressed the stop control and climbed out. The sand felt deliciously warm, and she kicked off her shoes and ran to the sea. She laughed and sang to herself as she paddled and splashed in the sparkling blue water and then went and sat on the beach to eat her lunch. As she was sitting on the sand, she heard a noise behind her, and three large brown birds, half her height, ran out of the bush and inquisitively examined her, running in circles around her and then away and finally back into the forest. She was tempted, ju- tempted just to say there are, stay there all afternoon, sitting in the sunshine, but she was there for another purpose, and after an hour or so, she got up and returned to the transporter craft. She sat in the craft and tested directions with the key, rubbing it and asking which way she should go. She felt she should continue to travel north along the coast, following the shoreline, shoreline as it changed from force to sea. It was a beautiful day. Large white birds swooped over her, their cries raucous and guttural, the only interruption to the stillness of the afternoon. She felt the key begin to heat up again, and soon it was throbbing on her chest. The shoreline seemed endless, cove after cove, beach after beach. At last, she came to a place that seemed a little different. One second. Okay, a little different. A stream cascaded from the bush-covered hills and fanned out across the lush and verdant valley. The key was almost red hot, and she had to pull it from her inside her clothing, afraid it would burn her. It seemed to speak to her now. She could hear the strange, assented voice. Go to that place below. Go to that place where the three streams join, join into one. There you will find that which you you seek. Essiana looked down at the land beneath her. As a stream mer- emerged from the forest and fell from the rocky cliff, it was quite a torrent, more like a river. Halfway between the forest and the sea, it broke into three tributaries, each flowing more quietly to the ocean, as if happy to have found their way home. Go where the three channels join into one, the voice of the key had said. She dipped her transporter craft toward the stream and flew down toward the place where the river split into three. 
It looked to be devoid of all life, to be just a riverbed covered in large stone sand and the little mossy vegetation. The, the key began pulsing so strongly and had grown so hot that even though Estiana was now wearing it on the outside of her clothing, it was, it was quite uncomfortable. She landed the transporter craft on an island at the center of the three streams and got out on the, onto the stony riverbed. The key almost jerked in her hands as if pointing out a direction to her. She looked up toward the rocky cliffs and the bush-covered hills beyond. A huge bird flew overhead, much larger than an eagle, with vast outstretched wings. It swooped and dived, focusing on its prey, a flock of smaller birds with bright green plumage that were trying valiantly to escape the huge bird's relentless pursuit. The winged predator was so huge that Estiana felt frightened. She screamed and ran for the covered safety of the transporter. It took some time in a clear sky before she felt safe enough to get out again. Standing once again on the stones, she held the key in her hands. Again, it jerked strongly toward the rocky cliffs beyond. She looked toward the cliffs, scanning the terrain for anything she could see that could be the reason for her being there. <clears throat> then she then she saw it. Halfway up was a path leading alongside of the cliff and into the forest beyond. The path looked to be quite clearly defined and not just an aberration of nature. It was constructed by someone or something for a reason. The key began to speak to her again. Follow the path. It begins at the edge of the waterfall. It will take you where you need to go. Have no fear. We are here with you. All is well. As Yana climbed back into the transporter and flew toward the cliff, her heart was pounding, but she knew that she was in the right place as the key hanging back around her neck was pulsing strongly. From the little island between the streams, she had seen a waterfall gushing down the cliff and into the forest, and this is where she directed the craft. She landed gently on the beach in the shelter of the cliff, as high up and away from the water as possible. She took some food and water from the transporter, placed it and a light shawl in a bag around her waist, and walked toward the waterfall. In the sunlight and against the white cliffs, its water looked like silver rain as it cascaded down the rocky hillside. Estiana had to walk a few minutes through the forest to get to the falls. She was quite guided by the sound of the rushing water. The forest smelled good. The rich, loamy soil underfoot was soft to walk on, and she heard the sound of birds, and here and there a sudden shaft of sunlight lit up the lacy foliage of the trees. As she got closer to the water, she came upon many beautiful white flowers, like small lilies growing rampant in the damp earth. She picked one and put it in her hair behind her ear. Beyond the next clearing, she could just make out the waterfall cascading down a steep rock face. She made her way past some very tall trees that seemed to stand like sentinels guarding the way. She rounded a bend and found herself by a pool, dark green and very still. The only sound she could hear was water, water as it splashed down the rock face and into the pool. At the edge of the water, it was a little boggy, and she carefully picked her way across the ground to the side of the pool. Scooping up some water in her hands, she splashed her face and arms. The water felt cool and refreshing. The key around her neck began to pulsate once more. She felt as if it was speaking to her again. Walk to the right of the pool. There you will find the path that we speak of. Oh, this is a long chapter. I've got one, two, three, three and a half pages left. We're reading Sunshine Before the Dawn, Chapter 13, Moo, which is like Atlantis and Lemuria, Lemuria, which is Moo. Asiana walked around the water's edge, searching for any sign of a path. She looked very carefully but could see nothing. She saw only trees and a much bushy vegetation, the white flowers and an occasional bird flirting through the branches. She retraced her steps, looking again for any sign of a track. Maybe I should go to the left of the pond, she thought. Maybe I've got it wrong. Even as she thought this, she was aware again of the voice of the key talking to her. 
No, go back, said the voice. The path is plain sight. It's for you to find. As Sienna walked back around the pool, looking again for a path that was in plain sight. I must have missed it, she thought, and walked more slowly, inspecting behind every tree for any sign of a path. Just off to the right, she saw three tall trees with huge trunks standing close together in a circle. As she walked closer to these trees, Asiana noticed that the ground in the center of the circle between the trees had been disturbed. She hadn't noticed this before because many little bushes with leafy fronds blocked her view. As she reached the tall trees, she saw that behind the farthest tree there was a path, a clearly defined path leading up through the forest to the cliffs beyond. She felt excited. Now she felt she could fully trust the voice coming from the key and that she wasn't alone. She started a, along the path. It was the black soil, the forest floor, but it was a definite path, obviously used for some purpose she could not as yet understand. She sang a gentle lullaby from Sirius as she walked, and for the first time since she had come to Earth, she felt a little homesick. After a short while, the path began to climb upwards toward the cliffs above. It was a gentle climb, not demanding, but before long, Essiana was high above the sea. She looked down to the beach where she had landed the transporter craft, and she could see it far below, glinting in sunshine. The path ran along the cliffs for a while, but then veered off through the bushy forest so she could no longer see the sea. She could hear it, though, a distance sound of the waves told her that the sea was to her left. The path continued to dip up and down as it ran along the side of the cliff. The key still burned on her chest, but not as much. It just seemed content that she was following the path. Now she could see a patch of the blue-green sea far below her through the trees, and the path began to curve down toward the shore. She thought to herself that she was walking back the way she'd come when she had flown north along the coastline. She hadn't seen anything then that was out of the ordinary. It all looked very beautiful, pristine, and untouched. Just as she rounded a bend in the path, she heard a sound. The sound like a horn filled the air around her. It seemed to envelop her as it swelled into a rich, deep crescendo that echoed through the valley. Essiana looked behind her as the sound came again, loud and deep, echoing the cliffs and filling her with its vibration. She felt a little anxious. She could still see the sea far below, and all around her were the tall trees of the forest. The track continued on ahead, dipping and turning as it would would, as it wound slowly down the hillside. She looked behind her. She saw no one, but then she heard what seemed like urgent footsteps coming behind her on the path. The sound came again, loud and ruckus, and filling the air with its reverberation. Anxious now and frightened, Essiana ran along the path as fast as she could go, her heart thumping in her chest, the golden key swinging wildly around her neck. She tucked it inside her clothing and ran on. She could no longer hear the footsteps behind her, but she still felt that someone or something was watching her. (sighs) One more in a page and a half. By now, she was almost at ground level and could see a, a beach below. For the first time, she wished that she had not come to this place and had stayed with the others on Moo. She would have to retrace her route and didn't much like that that idea, given the footsteps she had heard behind her. Then she remembered that Mossiana had said that the key would protect her, so she relaxed a little. The key had become hot again and was pulsing as she reached the beach, a tiny cove of fine, almost white sand. A tree covered in rich red blossoms grew very close to the sand. And a blue-green waves danced their way ashore, capped with frothy white foam that glistened in the warm sun. How beautiful this is, said Essiana aloud to herself. She looked along the beach. It was empty. No one was there. A few white birds flew around the rocky cliffs, but apart from this, Essiana could see no other signs of life. The key still pulsating on her chest. She pulled it out and held it in her hands, rubbing it gently between her fingers. See, I am here, she said to the key. Is this the place I need to go to? And if so, for what reason? What would you have me to do? The voice of the key began to speak to her again. 
Take me and go to the far end of the beach. There you will find what you seek. Who are you and why have you brought me here? Said Asiana. Why is it so important that I come to this place? We are the ones of we are the ones of being and becoming, said the voice from the key. We are from beyond the stargate of Lyra. You have come to this place for a purpose that will now begin to unfold. It is part of your soul's destiny. Asiana thought then about her visit to the Lyran stargate with Mastiana and the passage of new souls into the twelve dimensions of the lower world. She remembered seeing them come through the stargate into physical bodies for the first time. Her eyes filled with tears at the memory of the love she had felt emanating from beyond that portal. I understand, she said softly to the voice of the key, even though she didn't really understand at all. Maybe it was something to do with her wish to be born on on the earth in some future time. She walked to the center of the beach and, holding the key in her hands, stretched it out in both directions. When she turned to the left, the key went cold, and when she held it to the right, the key burned in her hands and began pulsing. She walked to the right, to the far end of the beach. It was a short stretch of sand, and as she reached the white cliffs at the end of the beach, she noticed another of the trees that grew the red blossoms. She walked toward it. And then the chapter ends. (laughs) And... uh, Next time we'll read chapter 14, Being being and Becoming. Oh, it must be that galactic group that just announced themselves called Being and Becoming. And uh, one of these times coming up, I'm going to have a special day where I'm going to read more than one chapter together. There's 20 chapters in this book. We're on chapter 14, and I really want to get through it in the next couple, two or three weeks. So does anybody know where the southern seas are? Okay, just think of the oceans of the earth. Where's the southern oceans and what lands are there? Is that Hawaii or is it somewhere else? Anyway. Candy, are you here? Anybody here? Come in and say hi to me, guys. Uh, Candy we had some busyness to do today and she might not be here. But anybody want to come in and talk? Any comments? Well, Otherwise, we'll be done. Hi. I, I just came back on. Somebody was in my house for a while. Oh, okay. The end of what you were reading, I just came back on. So I don't have too much to say because I didn't hear what you were <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to finish listening to it, just when I hang up, just uh, dial the recorded line six four one seven one five eight three. Uh, yeah. what is it? Three eight one three, and then the pin number, and then for the reference number, all you have to do is push pound because it's the last call. Right. right. Yeah, I'll listen to it. I'll listen to it. But anyway, guys, I'm going to get ready to go to work, and I hope you enjoyed it. You have a nice evening, you guys, and stay tuned for. Monday's call, we're going to continue the sacred sexuality talk, and we got lots of things in store there. Be sure to listen to all this week's calls. And go to the blog, Diamonds with an S Forever, 31.blogspot.com. If you ever want to call me, 763-670-9120. That's me, Elizabeth Diamond, signing off, and I love you all. Keep shining, Diamond. Thank you, Sunny and Missy and everybody. Thank you, for all you do. Great. Are you looking for healing or a change in your life to help you enjoy it more fully? You might benefit from a galactic energy reading and clearing from Chris Jacobs. Chris will work with you on a soul level to clear unseen negative influences, implants, programs, contracts, and energetic blocks. 
Chris Jacobs is a gifted energy healer. Contact him today at ChristopherStevenJacobs at gmail.com.